Oh, there you go. There we go. Hello, Ann. Can you hear me? She's trying to get her audio connected. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Hi, Ann. Hi. So I'm a, my husband's out and I've got the kids to myself tonight. So um, I'm going to be on mute a lot. I'll participate, <laughs> but I'm going to mute because there's like going to be a TV going in the background. I don't want to go upstairs and leave them running amok on their own. So I'm in, I'm in my pantry. Uh, you could just point your camera to the TV a little, maybe. <laughs> you guys want to watch Boss Baby? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll let you know when the fire department starts going toward your house, Ann. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> All right, let's uh, call the meeting to order. Um, if I could have your attention, this will be a virtual meeting of the Marinwood Community Service District Park and Recreation Commission. There will not be a public location for participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate telephonically or via internet by utilizing the web link or dial-in information printed on this agenda. Uh, now the instructions to uh, how to make a public comment during the meeting. At points in the meeting when the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature. Located within the Zoom application screen, if connected via telephone, please dial star nine. Um, first off, I'll just, I'd like to introduce and welcome uh, Director Case who will serve as the uh, board's liaison to the Park and Recreation Commission this year. Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much, John, appreciate it. Uh, moving on, uh, item number one is the adoption of our agenda. Uh, commissioners, do I hear any edits or revisions that you'd like to see? Uh, thus, hearing none, we will uh, adopt the agenda as presented. Uh, item number two would be public comment on non-agenda items. Do we have any members of the public that would like to comment? You do, John. One second, please. Stephen. Good evening, Stephen. Yes. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, then we'll move on to item number three. This is the draft minutes of our November 23rd, 2021 PNR Commission meeting. We will look to uh, approve the minutes. Uh, any comments from commissioners? Everyone's happy with it. Then I would uh, ask for a, a motion to approve the draft minutes of our November 23rd meeting as presented. So moved. Uh, motion by Fine. Second. Do I have a second. Second by Jossum. Uh, all in favor? Uh, you need to take a co public comment, John. Sorry. Oh, excuse me. That's right. I'm sorry. Uh, public comment on our draft minutes? Yeah, one second. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so I'll back up and again, I will uh, ask for a motion to approve the meeting, uh, the draft minutes of well, the- You've got the motion, John. So you have a, uh, Ian uh, Fine motioned and Ann Shawson seconded. Okay, we're good on that. Then, I would, then I'd call for the vote. All in favor? Aye, any opposed? None, so passes unanimously. Uh, then we'll move on to item number four. This is the draft minutes of the January 11th, 2022 board meeting. This is for our review. Uh, any comments from commissioners? I just had a, a quick question. I apologize. I, I haven't watched the Zoom uh, recording of that meeting, that board meeting, but there's a note on there about discussion around the exterior courtyards and budget. And I'm just curious if there was any uh, what what was the the summary on that? And I'm, uh, I'm keen to to hear what we'll be able to do with those exterior fenced in areas that we had to sort of trim from the budget um, a little while back. 
Yeah, we had talked about, and uh, I could take this. And I, I mean, Chris, sorry, you're welcome to jump in. It's your board, uh, not mine. But uh, one of the things that we had mentioned was, you know, we're working on getting a, a RFP out for the courtyards and how we're going to structure that. Um, unfortunately, I missed a bit of time last week and just haven't been able to make a lot of uh, headway on it. But we're it's we're working on it. So that's going to go out as a public uh, request for proposal, uh, just, you know, due to the cost thresholds that we're anticipating, it most likely is going to meet the bidding threshold. So uh, we'll put that out and we'll see what comes back with it, but it's still, our plan is the original design concept. Great. Glad to hear it. Yeah. And, and can you um, summarize, what was the findings on consent calendar A, the resolution for continuing to need for remote meetings oh yeah no it was it was approved okay yeah yeah that's at this point john that's just a regular resolution oh so that's they, there every the, month the board had that's why it's in the consent oh. calendar now the board has to uh, do it uh, basically every 30 days uh, otherwise you can't meet within those 30 days and it's written in a way that it applies to the board and both of the commissions Okay. Yeah, otherwise we wouldn't be meeting here. <laughs> if nothing else from commission, I'd seek a public comment on this item. Sure, one second. Steven. the draft minutes of the January 11th board meeting. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to item number five. Uh, this is the Marinwood Park Place Structure Replacement Project. Uh, we have community survey results. Uh, I don't know if uh, Ian, you wanna start off or Eric? Uh, either way, if Ian has had a chance to take a good look at this and has a few thoughts, I, I was able to look at it a little bit uh, since I put the agenda out. So I have a couple of thoughts too, but I'm happy to uh, turn it over to Ian first or any of the commissioners who, uh, uh, my, my thoughts are more along the lines of just kind of summarizing what we saw and the results. Do you want, why don't you go Eric and then I'll go after you. Sure. Um, you know, just trying to break down some basic statistics through this uh you know looking at each question and when you look at uh even question one how often do you visit i thought it was interesting that at least from our survey respondents you had you know approximately 70 percent who visit at least every week or two and half of those visit multiple times per week um so i i think we got a good selection of heavy users per se um for this and that's kind of what that told me and looking at question two um some of the things I found interesting was, you know, how popular the swings were. And I think you saw that in some of the other comments, uh, the open-ended comments about wanting more swings. I mean, you had, you know, half of the people who responded almost uh, like selected swings as their number one option from what they were presented with. Um, and close to 70% have swings in the top two uh, for this question. So, uh, you know, that to me was a little, I didn't expect it to be quite that big, but otherwise a lot of these fell pretty evenly across the board. There wasn't a lot of selection to um, um, to choose from, but that was kind of what I pulled. And then obviously the slides, while slides doesn't rank high as the top choice, I thought it was interesting that if you look at the second choice and the third choice, um, they really pulled in strong coming in at, you know, almost 65% of the, you know, from the people's top three, um, which just, you know, kind of shows where that's at. Um, I went through and I really found a lot of the open-ended questions um, and responses quite interesting. Uh, I think, you know, some of the themes and one of the big themes I pulled out from question three was uh, of uh, 88 people who bothered to respond to that question, 46% uh, of them, 41 responses specifically mentioned climbing features. So that could be rope climbing or jungle gyms or things like rock walls. Um, but I just kind of just said, you know, climbing and went through and counted all of those up. Uh, other things that came off is you had a lot of uh, commentary about either a theme or some sort of a unique identifying feature 
to the park that people would kind of equate to this park, just like at M Memorial Park is, you know, the dinosaur park, or uh, there's a park in Nevada, my kids call the helicopter park because it's got a play helicopter that you can maneuver in there. Um, and then the other thing I, I found interesting, uh, not interesting, but telling in here was a lot of comments about, you know, either, uh, and I, I guess it's probably geared a little bit more to the younger kids, but playhouses, uh, or other things uh, strictly for imagination purposes that they can, uh, you know, kind of get into their world of make believe while they're playing in there. Um, so, you know, you had, you know, train, I put like, you know, trains, houses, uh, playing, all of that kind of in that category of allowing kids to be a little bit more imaginative with uh, something that's a little bit more of a sed sedentary object. Um, and then otherwise, you definitely had some comments about the nature, the shade. Um, things along those lines and then you know to be very clear we have zero intention as we have discussed of taking out that tree um, that tree is a a that tree is incredibly protected but b it is such a nice feature in that big park and i also thought there's a lot of neat comments about just some of the other landscaping that's done in that area too uh, so i tried to go through and just look for some common themes that were coming out you had some you know kind of individual comments that i thought were interesting but my exercise with the time i had right now was really to just kind of say, okay, what, what am I seeing that is recurring theme in here um, and has a level of practicality to it as well? Um, you know, as to expect, you know, I mean, two to eight-year-olds were 86% of the respondents. Um, again, with uh, two to seven being the most um, part of me wonders too a little bit on that is it doesn't mean we don't have older kids but maybe they're not being accompanied by their parents and i think a lot i mean we did blast this out through a lot of our social media but i think a lot of our response came simply from those point of entry signs and qr code that we had and obviously they're the ones bringing so there, there could be a little bit of a statistical significance concern with the age but we go out there we see and i i, I think you know, two to eight is what I expect. Uh, I guess I was surprised that the two to four was the highest. Um, and then just trying to look at the last one, you know, a lot of good other playground uh, uh, suggestions on other playgrounds that they like. I haven't had a chance to really look too deeply into them or kind of go through some of the other comments. Um, I, you know, other than a lot of people very appreciative to feel like they had their, a chance to express their opinion and have their voice heard through the survey, which is always reassuring that, okay, uh, this is good. And I, I think the byproduct of this survey too uh, was, uh, even if they didn't take the time to complete the survey, I think it did a really good job at getting the word out that we are doing this project, that we're looking at this. And I'm sure word of mouth has carried that as well as people are in their own internal social circles uh, or other kid activities that they're saying, hey, have you heard they're redoing the playground at Marinwood? So. Um, I think we accomplished a lot of good goals with that. Those were some very, very high level takeaway items that I got in looking at this. Again, my apologies. Um, I've been pulled in a uh, personal situation for the past week or so and haven't had a chance to dive into this the way I really was expecting to, but uh, that's what I took. So if anybody else has anything to add or uh, extract from that, please. I'll just, I'll just echo a lot of what you said, Eric. That was a commendable uh, summary. I thought uh, I also haven't had, didn't get as much time with that as I would have uh, hoped, but we can, I think we can follow up in future meetings when we are, you know, continuing to work on this project as need be. Um, the couple of things that, I mean, I, I think Eric hit a lot of the, the ones that I was going to flag too, as like themes that seem to jump out, the importance of swings, the desire for more like climbing stuff for some older kids. Um, and then the, some of the stuff in those la in the last one in particular of um, the shade that, that every, so many people were talking about that oak tree. So I think it's important, you know, even though we weren't going to touch it, it's important to know how important that is to people. And then there was, I think there was a lot of stuff of like benches and even more benches, more places to, you know, sit and gather. Um, and I saw a few requests in there too for like, a wa like a refillable water bottle station or things like that, that I think um, were not things that I think would, were on my radar, but were worthwhile comments to get. And then I'll echo Eric's point too. I think that people's appreciation of the survey being out there, I found somewhat validating. And I think, you know, we will, I assume go back to these survey results at times as we're starting to move forward with the project. And I think it is important that we do another round of public engagement at those later stages 
Um, but, um, you know, I think it was nice to see that people appreciated this. And I think it, it, you know, as much as some of the information that we got is valuable, and I think we can work with that. Um, I also think it was just valuable to go through the effort and engage the community and get the word out, like Eric was saying. Yeah, the other things uh, that you made me think of too, Ian, is, uh, you know, as we put together the request for proposals on this and start getting them out to the vendors, I think it would be good to actually include this survey as it was included in the packet in these PDFs, just as an exhibit. Um, so that way they have this data in, in front of them too. Uh, and these are, you know, professional people who design playgrounds and can kind of probably look at this data and say, oh, I could think of this, that, those, and the other things that could go into this spot as well. So I think that could be a valuable tool to pass on. Uh, and I would include it in there um, as opposed to, you know, just sending it on to people who share interest just for the sake of transparency and everybody's got the same info. Anything else from other commissioners? Uh, I just want to add, I think this went fantastic. Um, it's great. The, the, the whole process with the survey and the results are wonderful. Um, I thought I also picked up on there a few different folks asking for taller slides, like taller climbing structures and taller slides. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting one. That's a real budget driver from, you know, when I was looking at just an initial look at playgrounds. So that's, uh, that's just an interesting lever to think about. But I think there were a few comments about that, too. I'll just echo yeah, it. Well. It's a great survey. We got a lot of response. It, my anecdotal summary, there's a lot of, in there on zip lines as well, huh? I don't know if Eric, you counted that up. Uh, I, I didn't count up the zip lines, but I saw that in there quite a bit. Uh, I would probably, on certain things, uh, I, I just have a little bit of a of a uh, risk factor involved for me personally, and zip lines tend to fall high on that list. Uh, but uh, I did I did see that a lot of uh, kind of uh, I, I can't remember the term that they really use for rope courses, but you know just kind of that rope course type of a thing. I definitely saw a lot of that. Yeah, I mean there there's uh, certainly plenty of zip lines that are safe you know like we have them up at stafford park in nevada and that i don't think we've had any issues there um right. they don't have to be high off the ground or super fast or long yeah i i, I that's that's right john and then when i saw those that's what i was i was picturing that uh stafford type um one and i think that's what people were probably getting at and when i saw some of the rope structure things i was imagining like the one that's over at maybe hall middle school or what it's like there's these kind of like, you know, pyramid like rope structures. Oh, and there's one over by kind of across from Marin General. That's a county. Hal, right? Hal Brown Park. Yeah. 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 Those, yeah. those I think are quite, I think, so yeah, I agree. When I was reading through some of those that you might not otherwise know exactly what people are talking about, I think those are what they were imagining. Yeah. And one I other think... thing I didn't mention too was I, another thing I took away in the, the, the open ended comment too was is in addition to the shade was a lot of people talking about, the, the creek and the importance of the creek being there and you know some people had ideas of trying to make the creek more accessible and things like that which we could consider maybe too but i just think that would be worth passing along to vendors and stuff just to like flag that i do think that's a defining feature of our playground is its location being right there next to that creek in that shaded area so that seems like something to just sort of keep in mind as we start thinking of design motifs and things like that yeah, the, some of the thoughts that went into my mind, too, were even just some uh, educational materials, you know, just some, you know, display boards kind of talking about it as the habitat and everything. I'm a little bit weary because once you get into, like, you know, entrance ways or some of the things people are talking about, um, you immediately get into permitting and, and regulatory agency. I mean, you can't really touch a creek bank too much with that type of stuff. But I think some of those interpretive signs, um, you know, just some neat uh, age appropriate educational material in that area could be really cool too. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a part of this project. That could be something we design with the local schools or, uh, uh, you know, some of the biology classes or our friends at uh, RCD uh, resource conservation uh, uh, department uh, have a lot, I'm sure have a lot of great ideas. I'm sure the County has good ideas on that um, just to help, you know, kind of bring more of a, cause there was a lot of talk about nature, not just the Creek itself too, but just nature in general there. And, uh, I definitely would like to see some of that incorporated personally. I think it would be really neat. Yeah. 
Eric, when this first came up, it felt like it was driven a lot out of the need to replace the structure because the parts are not replaceable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, although I, I like thinking about all these different aspects, like a water filling station, I think is super useful in new entryways and, and whatnot. Like, but we are really thinking about replacing the structure as part of this discussion, not, not like the much broader perspective, even, th even though, again, good to think about, but that might be separate from this. Is, is that how you would categorize it? Uh, I, I personally agree with you, yes. Um, I, you know, it's easy to start dreaming and looking at things. The scope of this project uh, and the grant that's funding this project is the replacement of the play structures. Um, not necessarily the redesign or uh, of that. But with that said, I mean, that does give us some room to do some enhancements, I think, to what's existing as well. And I think that's a lot of what people are kind of expecting. Because uh, the bottom line is when we do this, you know, it's probably not going to be done again for another 20 uh, plus years. So it'd be nice to really, you know, get something in there. But yes, the scope of the project itself is written through the grant is the replacement of the play structures. And that's, uh, it's a good point to bring it back full circle there, John, so thank you. Yeah, and then one, one more thing that stood out to me was that um, some people commented about potentially expanding the footprint of the play areas um, and issues with crowding. So I don't know if that would be within the scope of this project, but um, would be something worth um, considering if you could bump out the fence a little bit or something, if we were going to add additional features. Um, and then also another comment that I had was just that um, I think it would be helpful to have like a full, just like a chart of synthesizing the open-ended question about features, like you tallied up the um, climbing, but to do it with other things, just so we can have a more exact look at what themes people um, said. Yeah, I don't disagree. It just takes a little bit more time because it's not really a tool for that within the application that we use. But it, mm -hmm. it's not that hard to go through and count and find like kind of some co common themes. As I was reading through these, uh, you know, for me, that was the client. Literally almost half of them said climbing, climbing, climbing. And that was when I stopped reading. I grabbed my highlighter pen and just said, I'm just going to highlight every single time I see the, the phrase climbing. Because it, it, again, it just kept coming back and back and back. And if you think about it, it's one of the things we don't have a lot of at our particular playground here either. And, uh, and I think in terms of the rope climbing things is kind of taking the place of your traditional metal jungle gyms that, you know, we probably grew up with that, uh, you know, you can just hit several metal bars as you're falling off the top of it. So uh, probably a good reason. But yes, uh, Michael, I would, I definitely want to dig into this a little bit more and try to make this a little data, more data driven on that uh, aspect as well. Cool. I did notice a couple things in there that, uh, you know, they're not really able to include, you know, I saw things like uh, water features where, you know, you would really have to incorporate that into the pool pump system or it would be just a, a gutter to waste you know feature you know you couldn't recycle that water and then I saw comments about uh, that poured in place surface you know that rubberized surface as opposed to the wood chips and again that surface would pretty much have to go over a concrete surface and then putting a concrete over the tree roots is not something we want to do so even though that is a, a nice feature to have a, a, that rubberized port in place in a playground, this really isn't adaptable to that. So I, I think that, you know, there are some things that maybe just we can get back out to the community that although it's a nice feature, it's nothing we could do. And I, I would also like to comment, I like number 85, uh, Kid wants a little more danger. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that guy. I, actually, John, I want to piggyback onto that because that's something I was thinking about. We didn't capture that in the survey, and there must, in playground, the playground industry, there must be terminology for this, but a level of risk. 
Um, like I felt like when I was a kid, there was more opportunities to break my arm on this stuff. And, and I'm actually not even saying that's a bad thing. Like there's a certain element of, um, I don't know what you call it. It's like giving the child the opportunity to make a mistake and there's a consequence, but obviously not break their arm. But maybe somebody knows what I'm talking about that can articulate it better than me. But but also that it would be ADA accessible, right? I think that's automatic. It has to be ADA accessible, but I'm curious about the level of risk in the structure itself. And, and I know in your conversations, did you talk about that? Uh, I don't know that we necessarily talked about risk. I, I, you know, I haven't really personally spoken to any of the vendors. I, I do like the kind of, uh, you know, rather than term at risk, but that kind of sense of thrill a little bit. And I think, you know, that's where a lot of the taller and the climbing and those kind of things come from too, is it, it lends to a little bit more of a, a, a sense of thrill with it uh, necessarily. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know that we had those conversations per se, but I, I, I think, it could be uh, something to consider. And when you were talking to the manufacturers, did was that discussed at all? You're, you're muted, Ed. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, you know, where I saw it, not in the conversations with the manufacturers, but where I saw it kind of in the literature on the different play structures, is it's kind of like the level of challenge is one, is one way to think about it, is like how challenging are some of the climbs or the monkey bars or that type of thing. Um, and I, I actually kind of agree with you, a little bit of challenge is good because you want to have some features for the little kids that are, are you know, maybe more static, but... Uh, if you make the whole play structure really, really easy, it's not fun for very long, right? So you want to make it lots of challenges in there. Um, and that kind of goes along with the thrill and the, you know, the, the, the kind of difficulty factor, right? So I think there's some of that when you're looking at playgrounds and that's in the conversation too. Right. Going to have anything else? Did want to add? I don't know if Luke had anything he wanted to chime in with. He is our certified playground uh, inspector. Hoping you wouldn't bring that up. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> no, no, I, I, uh, I would only add um, as far as the the level of of risk. I, I fully agree. As someone that takes three kids to to playgrounds often. Um, I find that some of the older playgrounds uh, in the East Bay that, um, you know, I find surprisingly tall structures uh, without any guardrails and surprisingly steep, long slides uh, where, you know, he's like, geez, I, how's that allowed? You know, how does that, does that pass inspection? And, and I'm always, refre it's refreshing to me for the level of the, um, it's cha it is challenging and it does um, allow kids to aspire to, to greater uh, levels of, of uh, getting over their fears and trying new things. And I think as far as in the industry, from my exposure, just from, from getting certified and, and taking classes and reading through the material, um, the risk analysis is, is not, uh, I mean, everything in, in the playground and safety inspector realm is about, okay, well, if your play structure happens to be this high, then this is how uh, much fall material you need to have. And this is how far away the next structure needs to be. So it's about, if you pick the play structure, here are the parameters for everything else to make sure that we're not creating a hazard. Um, but as far as the risk in, in goes, um, the playground designers and the playground installers are bound by the rules that are going to keep the kids from um, getting themselves into a really unsafe um, position where they're going to get a really bad injury or, or something worse. And so um, as far as the risk goes, I mean, that all, that all kind of takes care of itself. So if we want a tall play structure, um, then, then we can build a tall play structure that's going to be more exciting and, and potentially more quote unquote dangerous. Um, but those other parameters will come along with it or else we're not going to be allowed to build it. So um, there is sort of a safety net built into all of this because of the, um, uh, the, the requirements that, that are put in place for playgrounds, um, which makes me feel good. And so it's just a matter of uh, what age group are we catering to? And, um, and are we offering something that, that covers kind of the span of, of our user groups? So I, I think we, I love the idea of erring on the side 
side of, of things being a little bit taller and a little bit more exciting and a little bit more um, challenging. Um, and as long as we have enough room to accommodate, you know, the, those structures, there has to be a perimeter, there has to be enough fall material, there has to be a certain depth. And, and so um, that'll be determined by the space that we have. But I, I think we can definitely go there and, and the, the rest of it will take care of itself. Thanks, Luke. Thank you, Luca. Anything else? I think I just have a quick question connected to what you said earlier, Eric. Um, how, how, how does this grant, and I'm, I realize I'm the one coming into this late, you guys have been talking about this for a while. How does the grant define replacement? Um, you know, you, you mentioned that we're supposed to replace our existing park structure, and that's obviously the critical element here. Um, but as we start to think a little bit more outside of the box. Um, granted, everything comes with a price tag. How, how does it define, like, do we have to work within the same footprint? Is there a certain percentage that we can expand the footprint? You know, things like that. Is there any guidelines through this grant? Um, yeah, it's not, you know, so things like landscaping or expanding the footprint I, is, is not, you know, this is for a capital, you know, outlay, capital uh, equipment, uh, basically, you know, uh, so it's not like we can really expand out, not to mention, I mean, at the playground itself, it's a little uh, confined, I think, kind of to the space it is, it's got those paved walkways that already kind of go around it. So you would need to, if you wanted to expand the fencing area, you got to, you'd be tearing those up and relaying out those. So that becomes a much larger project at that point, because then you've got irrigation concerns that are in the turf right next to those things. I'm sure uh, Luke is appreciating what I'm saying here right now too. And so it's, uh, I, I think we are, you know, confined within the space that we are in, but I also think in, you know, to your point, Chris, that the, uh, you know, early in this process, Anne had taken the time to kind of reach out to, you know, just some vendors just to get our initial brains working. And, you know, and Luke had, you know, just kind of rough sketched out the diet, you know, the uh, parameters that we're working with. And they really kind of, you know, came back with some interesting spacing ideas and things like that, that made it seem a lot bigger than how it's currently kind of laid out as well. So I do think that, you know, the space we have could probably be used more efficient, taking into Luke's account that how far various parts of equipment are spaced apart matter and everything else. Uh, I don't know. I, I would I would let Luke, Luke has a lot more, you know, day-to-day -day knowledge on what's happening in that area too. So if he has anything else to add, I think it would be great. I, I think that actually, Luke, I mean, you can say whatever you want to say, but that responds to my question. I appreciate it, Eric. Yeah. Okay, if no one has anything to add, I would ask for public comment on this item. Yeah, one second. Thank you, Stephen. So we will uh, move on to item number six. This is the Miller Creek Waterway Trail. This is hey, a, a initial hey, John, can I stop you for just one second? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, sure. You know, just kind of moving on just to kind of, I, I, I personally would like to just kind of close this with maybe like next steps on uh, where we're going here. Um, obviously, I wanna try to get a little bit more of the data crunched, you know, just like uh, Michael mentioned, and I think that that's a good idea. I wanted to start, um, you know, and I don't know if there's a commissioner or two who'd like to work on this with me, but, uh, and I've reached out to some other agencies who've, you know, kind of gone through this and gotten some of their, a little bit more informal proposals, but, you know, uh, uh, clock ticks pretty fast on these things and I, I would just like to start taking some of this and incorporating it as something that we could then um, dive into an actual proposal um, that we could start pushing out to vendors and uh, you know then start making those announcements and, and getting that out and kind of really looking at time frames um, so on and so forth as to when we can get this done um, so I, I think that's the next steps if there is like i said any commissioners who want to kind of work on crunching some of those or or looking at uh you know pushing this out and getting it ready for um, vendors because i think you know what it is and you just got to be a little careful in the as we get into the public bidding and the total cost dollar uh dollar cost we're talking about here is uh you know it kind of becomes a little bit more of a, a sealed public bidding opportunity and less of a uh, of a direct bidding because it's going to be above that threshold i would assume 
And just to just to follow up on that, Eric. So I mean, um, my recollection from our prior conversations was rather than like come up with a design and then get bids on that, we were going to do a RFP for like a design build or whatever. And okay, so it does seem like I mean, I mean, it, I agree with we should probably get the RFP out sooner than later and try to get people. Cause I do think once we have someone engaged, I mean, I'm envisioning coming up with some different, you know, designs and doing more community engagement and kind of, and I think this survey results will be useful in working on those design things. But I, but, but I guess what you're saying is we might want to seed the RFP with some of the information from in here. Is that what, is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. And not to say here's the design we want, but right. here's what the community spoke to. Here's the spacing that we have to do this with. Here is some environmental constraints and or concerns, you know, much like what John said about, which is a really good point on, you know, uh, uh, if you do a rubberized surface that involves concrete, that's going to kill off the trees around there, you know, it just so to lead them in the right direction, because I also think it doesn't do us a lot of good for them to come back with things that we already know are, uh, deal breakers for lack of a better term but yes um, i want to leave it to their creation and their expertise to say here's the broad strokes of what you know what we think we would like to see now help us really envision and uh, what this is going to be because i think that's just going to lead to much more creative proposals than we could probably sit here and come up with ourselves I'm happy to help with that. I do think it'd be good to have maybe a couple people, um, but I, I'd be happy to keep keep the ball moving forward on this. Great. Yeah, and if anybody else is, uh, you know, you don't have to commit right this second, but everybody knows how to get a hold of me. If you want to reach out, uh, maybe we could set up a little mini uh, Zoom or even a little mini in person. As long as it's not more than two commissioners, uh, we don't have any uh, – uh, Brown Act, and then whatever we come up with, we can obviously bring back to the uh, a future meeting and say, hey, here's kind of what we whittled down based on what we've learned and heard. Good. All right. Sorry, John. Thank you. I didn't mean to cut you off on the next topic. I just wanted to close this with the, here's where we need to do to keep this moving forward. No, that's good. Thank you, sir. All right. Now we will uh, look at item Number six, the Miller Creek Waterway Trail Initial Assessment. This is for our review. Um, yeah. We have a, a staff report that Eric submitted. And then I know, John, you've spent a lot of time looking at this as well. Yeah, um, I, I definitely want to let John to, um, speak a lot on this because it's A, his knowledge base, and B, he uh, was kind enough to devote a lot of his time kind of helping uh, get this report put together for us. Um, and I appreciate you calling it a, a staff report. Um, it, it's not up to the level of detail or analysis that I typically like, but it was what I had time to put together. Um, and so this, uh, just to be very clear, and then I'll turn it over to John, this is you know kind of what we had talked about and the board had directed that we do is kind of create this feasibility study for what this area is based on you know, some of the concerns that we shared about uh, the topography, the, the geography, everything else about what this was. So this report, um, while it took a little bit longer than we were hoping, is an incredibly detailed and good report. I was really pleased with what the output of the report itself was. Um, I'm going to let John, if he doesn't mind, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, Mr. Campo, but I, I would love it if you could kind of speak to this to some degree and kind of what went into it and how, how this was created and why the conclusions came to where they came to. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think everybody's seen it, seen the report, it's in the packet, and there's a, there's a table in there, a summary of trail alternatives, and that's a super useful table to just kind of get a, a really quick glance of different options and costs. Um, and I, I think before we even engaged with Tim Best, um, this, this trail geologist designer that I've worked with on other projects, he, um, you know, I was really explaining to him and, you know, and this commission talked about just the need, if we build something, if this does get built, to what standard is it gonna get built to? Is it gonna get scratched in by some volunteers on a weekend? and then 
require a lot of ongoing maintenance and upkeep um, and possibly be a safety hazard, or is it going to get built professionally by uh, people who are experienced trail builders um, with rock buttressing and realign it away from the creek where, where it needs to be to be a little safer so people don't fall off a bank and be a multi-use trail facility? Um, you know, this the location of one end on Las Galinas is right by the middle school. Uh, the other end by Casa Marinwood and the market, like it, it feels like if this gets built, it's going to be a very popular trail. It connects with the panhandle. It would be used by hikers, walkers, dog walkers, um, um, cyclists, um, kids on bikes, getting from the market, getting from Casa Marinwood to the school. Like it would be, I imagine, well used. So the, you know, Tim put out some different options, um, you know, and the preferred option kind of ticks all those boxes we were just talking about, it being safe, it being sustainable, and it being multi-use. Um, that's 1A, which is, you know, a cost estimate of 270, 274,000. That's based on prevailing wages and, and whatnot. And then the other end of that option or build would be 2B, which is $82,000. That would be just for hiking that wouldn't really ameliorate some of the erosive risks. Um, and it, it wouldn't be built to the same standard. And it would likely burden Luke and his crew with future maintenance. Um, so th those are kind of two ends of the spectrum there. Um, and then, you know, you can look at the map too. I know the map is, um, maybe a little hard for folks to, to kind of get some of the details, but, you know, one thing that was really nice about, you know, and I walked it with Tim a couple of times and talked on the phone about it a few times. And the nice thing is that we're able to avoid bridges. Um, so therefore we also avoid the need to involve regulatory agency permitting. If you cross a waterway, you need to get, involved with Department of Fish and Game, um, Army Corps of Engineers, et cetera. And that, that tax on a year, almost minimum, and tens of thousands of dollars, um, not only for the bridge build itself, but for the permitting. So he was able to kind of figure out an alignment that um, we, we don't need to build a bridge, which is great. Um, there, the built features would be, there's two sections of rock buttressing and that's basically just to hold the trail edge up and stabilize it. Other than that, it would just be, um, the trail would be cut likely with a mini excavator and just graded. Um, so not a lot of built features, which is, which is great. Um, I'm trying to think of what other details I could add. You know, there, there was a couple of steep sections on the trail and, you know, we try and avoid grades of in excess of 10%. And so there's one reroute that's further towards, uh, I guess, Marinwood market side. Um, that's the rock buttressing section that re reduces the grade. Um, and then there's one section that we really had to pull away from the creek and had another rock buttressing. But I mean, maybe I'll just open it up to questions if I can answer any to help. Well, and John, before you go there, I'm wondering, is it helpful if I pull this up and kind of just do a, a screen share, or would you like to do a screen share just on the report itself? I, I can I can pull it up pretty easily, um, and then when you're referring to, you know, various alignments or um, areas, uh, might be helpful. I'm not sure. Uh, you you tell me. Um, I can I can pull it. I, can I share it? Can I pull it up? Yeah, you should be able to. One second here. Let me just uh, give you the opportunity to. Yeah, you should be able to. And can I ask just as, as we jump into the conversation here, so just operationally, what's the flow of work around this and um, what do you need from the commission around this project? Uh, those are good questions from, uh, you know, the flow. I, I really, to be very honest with you, don't have my head wrapped around that yet. And I, uh, mm -hmm. you know, haven't digested that far or as far as what I need from the commission. I think we're certainly looking for some commission input and even potentially a, a 
you know, recommendation may be too strong. The, at the end of the day, I, you know, the ultimate decision on what the move is going to have several factors to it. Um, you know, there is the question of the developer and what's the reasonable expectation for their financial contribu uh, contribution to this. Uh, there's the question of the board and what's their appetite uh, for, you know, the kind of financial aspect of this. Um, you know, probably, uh, you know, some of the other things that John just mentioned, and then ultimately it's going to be a decision to be made by the board. If I can just jump in for a second on that, uh, I think Ann and, and the rest of the commission members, I think the board would definitely be interested in what you guys think about this, what you guys think the best plan would be, um, you know, all of those kind of recommendation level ideas. It would help us out dramatically, I think. Agreed. All right, John, go ahead, sorry. Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure what else I, I could point out some of the specifics. Can you see my cursor mm -hmm. on the screen? Yeah. yeah. So this was one section right here. So just to orient folks, here's Las Galinas right here. Um, so here's the, the origin of the trail right here. This section right here, we were a little concerned we'd have to interface with the stream. We did not, we were able to go right above it. So that was the not needing the bridge, which was great. There was a couple of dry swales in this area that I didn't realize they're, they're inactive um, waterways at this point. And so that also did not need a bridge, which was great. Tim dug into some historical maps and identified that the Miller Creek was actually moved. So it used to be over here. And he suspects when they built this development, they moved it into this channel here. And so I, I didn't realize that, and that probably changed some of the, some of the flows in this area were changed too. Um, so these purple sections right here, here, and here. So these are the rock buttressing sections that would hold up the edge of the trail. This, this, the trail, the, all the multicolor is mostly in, if you've walked it out there, it's, this is kind of the obvious alignment you would take. The one section where it peels off is right here. So this dashed blue line, this is kind of where there's a, a little bit of a worn trail and an old road cut right along the edge of the creek. So this is where he's proposing pulling it back a little bit to get away from that steep bank. And then right here as well, this one gets pulled back a little bit to, to reduce the grade. Um, and then as, as the trail goes further to the east, this is pretty open on this side and this could be built in a variety of ways, it would just kind of develop, depend on the development of the housing and what made sense on this end. That would be pretty easy though. John, on that east end there, it shows basically a 10% grade. Would that be as steep as the trail gets? That's the goal, yeah, is to not exceed 10%. So that's, because it, 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 this is a, What's the construction area? That's for a, a, a um, retirement community or something? I think it's in an assisted living, right, Eric? Just a, yes. So it's a sen senior living and assisted living, correct? So 10% is doable for them? They, I mean, they would be. Yes, yeah. A, lot of users, a user yeah. of the trail as well. Yeah, exactly. 10% 10, 10 is an acceptable standard. About a foot every five feet or so. Yeah, I would say that's an important thing to take into consideration, especially if there's family that's coming to visit. And people want to go out and use the trail a little bit. It'd be really nice to offer something to that uh, community. Right. And most of this alignment is pretty flat, um, especially on the west end. As you walk all this, it's not steep at all. It's not until you get into this area it gets quite steep. And that's what required some of those realignments to reduce that grade. John, with your experience with, you know, um, trails and bicycles, right? So if you look at some of the, uh, on the option sheet, like there's, there's one that's kind of midway down that says, okay, there's this one section that's gonna be too steep for bicycles. But just question for you is where is that section? And what are your thoughts on that? Is it, is it 
a significant portion that's too steep for bicycles or is it like just people are going to hop off and walk a little bit and then get back on? Um, so that, what do you the, think? That's this section right in here. Okay. And so really it's, did he write it's too steep for bikes? I mean, it's, I, I don't know if I would have categorized it quite like that. I, I think our goal is this, this, the idea of this trail, in, at least in my mind, anyways, it's not, a fun recreational trail like like if you've been on Ponte um, that's a that's a very different experience than what I would imagine this would be like this would be a connection it wouldn't be a destination um, and it really wouldn't be designed in a way to provide a thrill so it's really about getting people from one end to the other in a kind of a, a serene and safe way and, and the trail should be a sustainable build. So um, this this is the section, Anne, that he's talking about that's pretty steep right in here. I think we measured it at like 18%. And so just trying to get it down to 10%. You know, an 18% grade, um, you could ride up that on a bike, but it's not comfortable for a lot of people. But I think more importantly to John's point, this, this is not the the cyclists aren't the focal group here. It's the community. And that includes seniors, dog walkers, includes everybody. John, can I, can I ask you a question while we're looking at this on the Eastern end and you can kind of see where Marinwood Avenue comes in, uh, uh, you know, where the market is a little higher up where your cursor is kind of where that STN 1800, 1900, sign is so the road is going to come in yes the road is going to come in from there um and you know make its way well along the bottom of this hillside my only question being is that you know once they kind of have finalized plans for that which they don't have yet and they don't have construction plans done they just kind of have you know concept and planning documents uh, how modifiable is this kind of end point here as it's currently drawn out like, Very. Okay, good. Because I don't know that we'd want the trail to come, you know, quite as far south as it does, especially with if the road's going through there, you know, people are going to, it's just going to start to develop little footpaths that are going to lead you to a closer point, say, to the market or to the, um, uh, to the Casa Marinwood and things. Yeah, the, the end is very modifiable. And I wasn't sure what your conversation with Tim was on the end, if any, but um, he probably just drew it straight out. It, because it's undefined at the moment. Sure. Um, but if you look at these contour lines, these gray lines, they're pretty wide apart. That lets you know that, that mm. it's not very steep. Um, this over here is quite steep. So like we wouldn't just come like this and connect straight down. Right. That would be too great of a grade. But you know, maybe it does something like this. It comes like this and switches back this way. It sure. connects over, whatever, you know, whatever makes sense, but that's very modifiable. No, that's good. I'm just trying to avoid people, you know, kind of creating shortcuts per se. Exactly. Yep. You know, while um, we're talking, um, while we're talking about the the end of the trail, and I, uh, John, I don't think you were you were here. There was one commission meeting where I brought this up, and I I just wanted to voice it again. Is you know, I would I would love to have someone who, and maybe this is also you who has a perspective on on safety and community planning um, as we think about putting this trail in, right? So the concern I have is there, there's, there's intermittent encampments in the area where we're thinking about connecting this trail, right? And if you think about the city of Novato and what they're dealing with, they've got a shopping center and they've got a trail by a creek and now there's a massive encampment and they can't get rid of it. So I have a little bit of a concern about putting in a nice wide trail that connects where we know there's known encampments and there's issues. Um, kind of connecting that into the rest of the community. So it's an unfortunate concern, right? Because we'd rather just think about this trail from how fun it would be to be connected to Marine One Market, you know, but it's a reality that there is, um, there is, you know, that, that we need to think about in Marin for all of our communities. And so far, you know, Marinwood is relatively sheltered, um, but I just think as we we think about building things, something as big as this in our community, we're connecting right into open space where there's been a history of, of difficulty with that. It's just something that I think needs to be talked about, planned around and considered, right? Is to take that additional safety piece into consideration. So yeah. I know that's like kind of a huge 
that's a huge thing I just threw out there, but um. it's no, it's, it's, it's a good question and it actually comes up a lot. Um, so I, I used to do this work in San Francisco quite a bit, and this was a, a big concern and actually it, it might sound counterintuitive, but we had this philosophy of trying to activate spaces to, um, to discourage maybe undesirable activities such as illegal camping and open space. Because right now, if, if somebody wanted to make a camp or a shelter in here, they could, they could go in there. There's nothing preventing them from going, the, going in there now. And I would add that it's probably preferable the way it is now because not many people are using it. Actually, nobody's really using it. It's a trail that somebody who was wanting to camp would use and then be able to somewhat hide their tracks. If we activate this space with a trail that dog walkers, um, kids, parents, whoever is using on a regular basis, then that space becomes activated and it discourages camping. So that those people would you know, be making calls and say, hey, there's a big camp setting up here. Somebody needs to do something about this. And so it becomes less desirable of a place to camp. Yeah, that's helpful. And what do you think about, you know, that we would be really connecting a footpath, footpath to the rest of our community center? You know, I often think about sort of protecting our community center because we have bathrooms, we have water, we have resources, we have a big park, right? And I think we're further, for, far enough away from a grocery store or something like that, that it's unlikely we're ever going to have a large encampment in the Marinwood Park area. Um, you know, usually that tends to happen more like in your safe way or something like that. Um, you know, but it's just, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, if that's, you know, just, just creating a, a connection point, like to that area under the bridge over by Las Colinas, right. Or even into our greater resources. Um, I, I guess I, that, that doesn't concern me for, for the kind of the reason I just mentioned. I, I feel like right now, like that, if, I don't know, Ann, if you've been out here, but this is an old road cut, this trail that, you know, Tim's kind of mapped out. It's, it, it's pretty accessible. It's pretty open now. So you, and there's a whole bike um, uh, section of trails back here. So it's, oh. it's not as if it's, um, uh, it's inaccessible. You, you can get over there pretty easily. So I, I would argue that it's already, that connection's already there and that problem's not there now. And, and again, I think activating it with regular neighborhood use um, only makes it less desirable. Okay, that's great. That's very reassuring. Thanks for taking those questions. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just riff for a second. I don't know if, I mean, I guess this is like, just maybe respond to kind of Chris's um, ask for um, just sort of commission feedback. Um, I, I I think this is totally worth pursuing. And I think, you know, especially if, I mean, if this is in that, the, I, sorry, I don't my legal terminology, but if it's like in the development proposal that the developer will provide something like this, I mean, we should be, we should, I think we should be pushing this forward and trying to make this happen. And, um, you know, it may be that, you know, push comes to shove down the line on how much it's going to cost and how much it's reasonable to have the developer pay for it or whatever. But um, I think uh, this sort of connection, I think is, ex would, it would be a huge asset to the community from having grown up here. And like what makes the part of what, going back to some of Steven's comments from the beginning, I mean, part of what makes this community so great and to, to, to have grown up as a kid here and to live here, to raise kids here, is its accessibility and um, walkability. And um, I volunteer, Eric knows, on the Safe Routes for Schools program. And, you know, to have, I, I really honestly, like this, this sort of connection from Miller Creek Middle School in Las Colinas down to that Marinwood Market area and that bike path that goes into Novato and all that is like kind of locked off. Like, I, like whoever designed the Round Tree and the Casa Marinwood there should have been walking paths that connected those and go went through, but there's not. And so now it funnels, you know, your six year old on a bike out onto Miller Creek road, which is like not that safe to be going down to the, you know, uh, you know, get, sending your kids down to the market to get a snack on their own or whatever. So I just think, I think this, you know, and the, the vision of, you know, for some of 
a lot of us who were around back when it wasn't just Marinwood Market, but it was a, you know, a vibrant plaza with lots of other things there. And like, eventually one will hope that something like that will come back. And to have, I mean, just if, if, like going back to Stephen's comments from the beginning, imagine the couple decades from now when it's not just Marinwood Market, but there's a coffee shop and a pizza place and an ice cream parlor and a whatever, and you can walk with your family from, or you can send your kids down on their own on this you know, path um, for, to get down to that plaza and not have to walk on Miller Creek Road through the gas station. Um, I just think this is like, this would be just, a, has huge potential for the, for, for the community. And I understand the concerns and the, you know, potential maintenance costs and, and all of that. But, um, but, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Panhandle path and Blackstone Canyon and those kinds of things, like that's what makes Marinwood, Marinwood, and uh, be able to make this kind of connection, I think would just amplify all of that exponentially. And it's already in a, I mean, it's already in a developer's proposal where there's a requirement for them to, you know, do this. So why would we not like pursue this and try to, you know, get the best path that we possibly can? Um, you know, in terms of those preferred, I mean, I think we should definitely be pursuing that preferred 1A. I noticed that the developer proposal language, it says like four foot wide, whereas our preferred 1A would be five feet wide. So I don't know to John Campo whether that's like, you know, whether preferred 1A has to stay at five or whether it would be, I understand five would be better than four, but God knows why they wrote four into that in the first place. But I'd be curious on that. But But otherwise, I just, I don't know, this strikes me as, an incredibly great opportunity for our community. Um, so at least speaking for myself as a commissioner, I would, I think we should be totally doing everything we can to try to make this the best that we can. I guess one other question I'll just pose, I don't know. Um, I've seen on maps before, I forget which maps I've seen it, but I've seen like a plan for, or not a plan, that's probably an overstatement, but the possibility of a bike route that sort of parallels 101 there like kind of like the one that takes us to Novato but going from Marinwood Market down towards Lucas Valley Road Smith Ranch area I've just like seen that on you know future planning maps somewhere or whatever I don't know if John Campo if you know anything about that but that that would seem to me as like yet another reason why um why this could be um you know really important to kind of connect up with that potential link as well I don't know about that per se, but I, I will just echo your passion for it. I I also think this is a tremendous opportunity that we shouldn't squander. Um, there, there are certain things that make trail projects, because I, I do this every day, like just impossible to get off the ground. This one, a lot of the hurdles are already crossed. Um, and if, if the money is the biggest obstacle, it, that might sound like a big obstacle, but in compared to some of the other challenges, it's, yeah. it's doable. It's doable. I, when, when I first walked this with Eric, I was concerned that it's like, oh, this, these banks are really erosive, really steep. Um, and it's going to require bridges. And it's like, I just th didn't think it was going to be feasible after walking with Tim and talking it through, um, and him coming up with this, I, I'm super encouraged that it is doable and it is possible. And, and I, I think it would be a tremendous asset for the community. John, in your kind of experiences too, as you're kind of going through this and obviously, you know, you're looking at various levels of community outreach, uh, not only to the broader community, but certainly to some of these homeowners at the western end of the trail where it's going to wind up going really close to them and then the other aspect i and you and i talked briefly about this when we spoke uh, uh, a week or two ago was uh you know kind of the cultural resources assessment and uh you know some of the sequa stuff and i know you said you know there's a good chance this could very well be exempt but um you know i also think that's something that um while the regulatory it looks like we could, uh, you know, dodge that bullet for lack of a better term here. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure where, you know, because the sequel process, the cultural resources process, uh, uh, you know, certainly takes some time and some investment too. Do you have any kind of thought or insight on that? 
Well, from a permitting perspective, we would need a, a grading permit. So that, that's the one permit we would need. And then there's the environmental re review process. And whether that's a categorical exemption or an initial study, that would be determined you know, in the process. Um, but I, Eric, I think you, did you write the CEQA for the um, maintenance facility? I certainly helped with it, uh, yes. So, so, I mean, we could do that in house, it sounds like. Um, yeah, we, you, as that was from the uh, from the uh, initial study, basically, and kind of the the template for an initial study. So it'd be kind of taking it from there, and uh, right, uh, you know, keeping all the questions and then f filling in the appropriate answers. Right, and so then there would need to be some level of assessments, some biological assessments, and some cultural assessments, similar to what you did with the maintenance facility. Um, and so, and then this, in my experience, I would suggest that the report that Tim provided is, is good enough uh, for a construction plan set. I mean, the, the trail builders that we would likely um, ask for or put this out to bid to would be experienced enough to, you know, it's almost like a design build. And that's mostly how trail projects go. Um, trail plan sets are mostly alignments. And then there's a description for built features. This trail does not have a lot of built features. It has rock buttressing, that's it. So it's really just kind of going out there, flagging it and following this. Um, so it's not as if we would need to develop additional construction plans. So that's, you know, then there's obviously, as you mentioned, the community outreach which would be a component that we would want to take care of as well. Yeah. Ian lived or, and still does more or less, but did, you know, across the street, your big move um, right next to one of our main trailheads. Um, I, I know the Cadonis who live right next door to this. And, and certainly I agree, we should be discussing that with, you know, the people who are most impacted, but Ian, do you have any feeling about, how this might impact somebody who lives right next to it? I mean, I, I guess, you know, this would feel more, less like a Queenstone trailhead and more like people who live along the um, panhandle path. It would, if, you know, um, so I don't, I, I, I don't know if any of, and I think some of our commissioners might live near Quietwood, but um uh, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. I, 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 it's worth, I definitely think we should always be talking to neighbors. Um, but, um, uh, I don't know if I, I think people, the people I know who live near Elvia and in those areas, like are people often with young kids and all of the, and so I don't know, I think there'd be, it'd be a huge, um, a huge asset even to them to have, um, I mean, I bet you would make their property values go up. Um, not that that's what would be motivating them, but it would just, you know, to have this kind of like um, community asset right there near them and have them have this walkability to the market area. I don't know. I, I don't want to speak for anybody. We should definitely talk to them all, but um, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't guess it would be a, a non-starter with, with those people. Hey, Ian, you know, I live on Quietwood and, I mean, it's great. Part of the reason we bought our house is we walked through, we love the house and we went out the, you know, into the backyard and opened the back gate and we were like, wow, it backs up to Wonderland. Let's get this one. Right. So, I mean, I, it, I think a, a trail like that in general is really positive. Of course, when you change anything near anybody's property, there's going to be probably good to have a period of socialization and bring them on board because the construction process and the thought of change, or there might be some little footpaths that they love or something like that. Um, you know, well, that would be, you know, part of the process, but just in general, living along the quiet wood path, I mean, it's wonderful. It's an asset, you know, people walk back there every day and it's lovely and we love it. So very positive. And, and as far as the neighbors on the round tree and Casa Marinwood side, I, I, I think my guess is this would only be a huge, huge benefit to them. I mean, I know we have friends with younger kids in the Casa Marinwood area and, um, I think having a accessible path for them to be able to get up to Miller Creek school and, um, do all that, I think would be, like I said, otherwise they're 
forced through the gas station and up Miller Creek Road, which is not the not the not the best route for young kids to be traveling, especially when you know they're unattended. And can I ask, because I, I know, actually, I'm looking at our thing. So the three homes closest to the proposed trail, the one closest to Las Colinas is the Cadonis. And then the next larger home that is on the cul-de-sac there is the Hunters. And then the Quans are right next door to the Hunters. Yep. Um, I, I could see those three families <laughs> easily wondering, like, like, do you ever feel like backing up onto the path on Quietwood compromises your home safety? Uh, was that a question for me or is that a question for those just, families? Just purely like, uh, you know, just looking for, uh, you know, if you've ever felt like your, your house backing up onto Quietwood, you know, if you ever felt like that compromised your safety with all the pe people walking back there, I just, I, I know those three families and that that's a potential that's if I were if I were having this put behind my house, I'd wonder, okay, now people have access to my back fence. Like how does that yeah. feel? I'm just curious to how that feels absolutely, for you. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a security element to it, right? I mean, for us, we're uphill. So I don't know if those houses are uphill of the trail or on par. So like if you go down quietwood, there's houses where you look right over their fence into their house. So for a situation like that, that's a little bit more unnerving than for me the trail is here and my my there's a hill so you can't really see into my backyard unless you come up the little hill um but definitely you know there's there's more more foot traffic back there um and we're aware of that as a you know security um and you know it's it's certainly part of why i even am participating in the parks commission is because i want to be involved with what happens with that land back there and the safety and security associated with that land so I think it would be on people's minds for sure. Hey, Chris, if I uh, could chime in to that one, um, those uh, specific houses, um, I, we, I've dealt with those residents um, over the years. And um, I can tell you that that point where, where the trail starts, where, where the majority of those houses are, um, is already an, an access point. And to, to John Campo's earlier point, um, that's already kind of a protected spot for, for people to go and hang out and it's accessible. And I think an official trail would probably have that same, uh, that's that same element of like bringing more foot traffic and making it more uh, visible and, and be more of a deterrent for any activity that people don't want in their backyard. Um, and I can't speak for those residents, but that seems like right. it would be a positive more than a negative in that respect because there already has been issues back there for them um, without a trail. So. Okay, cool. Thanks, Luke. I appreciate it. Hey, John, can you highlight over a house? Um, uh, yeah, just pick one kind of in this general corner there. Not that one, but if you go over, like, say, on the corner of where the court is there. Uh, yeah, Chris, who lives there? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. I had to add a little remedy. <laughs> <to it. laughs> um, okay. Uh, I, I could probably tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, well, I, this is a really good conversation. Obviously, you know, you have some public comment to take to, and as I'm kind of, you know, listening to this and one of the things I was also talking to, uh, you know, John, and, and I think we've expressed here a little bit too, is, you know, in the overall considerations, I, I do think, I know what's written here. Um, I know that this was written a long time ago, but I do think that it, it is still some level of a conversation between the district and the developer as to what is a reasonable um, expectation towards um, financial contribution and everything else for this trail. I, I think that needs to kind of get squared away. I, I've talked to this developer on several items uh, several times, and I did send him a copy of this uh, on Friday as well. Haven't had a chance to communicate with them, but I, I am sure he is digesting it. Um, and I'm sure when he saw that top number of the recommended project, his eyeballs probably fell out of his head uh, for it. So I, I do think that that's a conversation. I, I, have, I would hate to see that move in more of a legal direction, but uh, you know, it, it could depending on where people want to dig their heels in. From there, I think you know, it obviously pivots to the board a little bit. Uh, you know, whatever that number is, assuming it's not all of it, uh, you know, what is the appetite to spend on the board, um, potential sources of funding, and John and I talked about sources, and there are some grant opportunities, but, 
you know, those are uh, work. And I did, I also got that same email that you forwarded to me, John, unfortunately, uh, my week was uh, not involved in that. Um, unfortunately, just, again, I had a personal situation to attend to. Um, I, and I think from there, if this project was to move forward and just speaking very openly, um, I, I certainly have concerns about staff bandwidth to manage this. Uh, and just from a project management standpoint, um, I know that a lot of the work and the construction work is done, but just talking about the CEQA stuff, talking about the community outreach, and then once this thing does, and assuming it gets going, it's still a project that still needs to be managed. Um, and I just, I, I just am speaking openly when I say I certainly have concerns about the bandwidth of that, especially given uh, whatever the, a lot of that would depend on timing and some of these other bigger projects being completely wrapped by then. Um, and I don't know what the opportunities are to outsource, um, uh, you know, help with that uh, is obviously that's an extra cost too. So I think all of those are kind of the considerations. Uh, I certainly agree with John in that based on our very first walkthrough, I was very um, concern that this was a, a practical possibility. I think that this report and having, you know, a set of expert eyes and designer eyes on this has eased a lot of that. Um, I appreciate that it, it does seem to be much more doable than I, in my amateur vision, assumed it to be. Um, but I, I also think that there's still a lot more consideration points to this than just do we build it or don't we? Uh, that said, I also tend to agree with what Ian and some of the other people are saying is this seems like a really good resource and a really good opportunity. And I think if we don't pursue it on this go around, it'll probably never come to life. So, uh, you know, those are a lot of ways to think about it. Uh, and certainly information. Thanks, John. Certainly information that I personally would be bringing to the board as part of their consideration factors as well, along with uh, any recommendations. I will have this on the board agenda. Um, for the next meeting, I, I will, uh, I always include the commissions on the links to those meetings and I would certainly encourage uh, uh, any commissioners to uh, come in and between Chris and Luke and myself, we will certainly try to do our best to um, relate the views of the, of the commission, but I, other commissioners are encouraged to participate in that meeting, uh, you know, via the comment periods too. So, um, I think I've kind of wrapped that up. Is there anything else, either Luke or, or John Campo, that I'm kind of missing on the things that we've talked about here? No, Chris, I would just offer if you're interested or any of the other board members, I'd walk you out there. And with this map, which is geo-referenced, so you can use your phone and you know where you are on the map and kind of look at the different features. And so we could, if you want more clarity around it. Can I'll I just ask a flashlight and some water right now? I'll meet you there in 10. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Can I ask a question just going back to some of the sort of like, you know, the process stuff here too. I, um, I mean, the, the, I guess, and this goes to your question about bandwidth, Eric and timing and stuff. Um, I guess I forget, I forget what prompted this new round of conversation about this trail. And, and I guess that's related to the question of just like realistically, when would, I mean, there's going to have to be conversations with the developer. The development project's not going forward right now. I am assuming they wouldn't put, you know, put the money, you know, pay, put, hand the money over until they get further along in their actual development project. So I don't know. I guess, I guess I'm just curious of like where we're situated in times and that, you know, both like why we're talking about it right now, but also my sense is that this would actually probably be some time out before the work actually was required, but, but maybe I'm wrong about all that. Yeah, I don't disagree with you on that. I mean, just from a language of what I copied and pasted here from the uh, agreement, and I, it, I think it's in this part, and if it's not, I apologize, because the agreement talked about several things that weren't necessarily uh, ordained to this uh, trail, uh, but there's certainly language in there that, you know, none of this would even move until that road is done. Uh, the extension of Marinwood Avenue that's kind of going through. So that's kind of one of the kingpins. Um, from the project itself for the senior center, they are still in planning. So um, it has initial approval. They wanted to make some changes because this isn't the original developer of that senior center um, that, you know, 15 years ago got the initial kind of loose planning approval for this. That 
developers sold the rights and the property and now this is a totally different group who's building this they wanted to make some changes i can tell you from experience of you know what should have been a very simple maintenance facility replacement that uh, that process and working with county planning takes a lot of time um, so they're still kind of going through that. I've had some conversations with them on various things. What spurred this was actually the developer and their uh, engineer reaching out to us and saying, hey, we're getting closer on this. We'd like to kind of talk about this trail aspect. Um, they initiated that conversation and that was, boy, several, uh, several months ago now. So with the uh, with their uh, civil engineer who, you know, a gentleman named Irv Schwartz, who was also one of the people who uh, I think, you know, back with Chris uh, in his time when he was on the commission was one of the kind of spearheads behind putting this clause in the development uh, proposal when we took on that piece of property in the first place. Um, again, you know, and uh, uh, John can speak to this as well as I can. A lot of things have changed in the last 16 years on the way things get done and the way things are built and, uh, and you know, the standards. And we've kind of learned some lessons along that line too. Some the hard way in terms of if you're going to do something, make sure you do it right. Make sure it meets high standards. Make sure it, uh, you know, the, I think the days to John's point of going out and scratching, a, you know, with some volunteers, a trail in there. Um, I have massive reservations towards just because I think it opens up a lot of, uh, uh, consequences uh, that we have certainly had to deal with based on those previous actions of years and years past. So um, I, I, it's kind of a long way of answering your question, I think, Ian, but I hope I answered it. Eric, can I just add, when Irv came and spoke to us, unless I'm mistaken and you can totally correct me, um, one, of the, one of the things that, that the developer's representative brought to us was the fact that they would offer to donate, was it 35,000 to the district if we chose not to build the trail? Yeah, what that number comes from is actually, and I'm gonna call it a performance bond, but it's not technically a performance bond. There's actually language in the larger agreement that has a, a performance bond stipulation of 29,000 in it. Um, and I think that that was kind of a round number maybe that they were using 16 years ago. Obviously, I, I can't really speak to that. I've asked uh, the former district manager about it a little bit. He doesn't have a uh, great memory on it. I, you know, Irv obviously has a, a pretty sharp memory of all things historic. And I don't know if you remember, but that's, that's where that number kind of spurred from. And I think that was also from uh, a result of our initial walkthrough with John, uh, Luke, myself, and Irv, where we just said, wow, okay, this is a lot more overgrown and challenging than we think it's going to be. And I don't know how practical it is, but that was why, I mean, you know, it was good foresight on the board's part, you know, with the recommendation of you really need somebody who this is what they do. They come through, they analyze sites, they, uh, they you know, kind of put in designs, you know, and that's what Tim Best did with this report. And, and again, I, I do really need to thank John Campbell. He's put in a lot of time and effort and he certainly has a, a lot more experience and expertise behind this than, than I will ever have. Um, so that was, you know, it was just nice to get, you know, kind of some objective uh, uh, eyes out there to kind of look at this as well as some local eyes too that, you know, have a passion for this in the community. So it, that's how that came together. Can I ask one question? Um, the developer language mentions a second trail that goes to the ridge. Um, is that something that we are also going to consider or have we eliminated that from the scope? I would not consider it. Um, the steepness factor of that alone is, is pretty foreboding. And I also think that a, a little bit to Anne's point, that certainly leads into other areas that aren't as populated. Um, uh, I, I would tend to go against that for where that particular area is. Yeah. But that's just my opinion. And I think just so the commission knows when, when we were, you know, when Irv was kind of giving us the scope of, of the thought process with the, you know, 35,000, um, that's when we, I think Ian, this kind of speaks to your question. That's when the, the board said, you know, that we'd really like to investigate this and kind of along your, 
same lines as wow, this could be a tremendous opportunity here. So, you know, it, it wasn't like there was a check being handed to us and it was like, do we take it or not? But it was a conversation and we said, no, the conversation is going to be around, let's look at this trail. Let's, let's really make some thoughtful, um, you know, choices here for the future of the community. It's a good conversation. Hear anything else from the commission? Thank you all for your input. This is very good. Uh, I would ask for public comment on this issue. Yeah, one second. John, thank you. Well, this uh, report is very interesting. I um, wasn't sure what we would see, but uh, I think it does add a lot of useful information. And yes, this is a legacy project we, that uh, is a rare opportunity uh, to really make a mark for decades to come in the community. None of you will be on the board and will have new employees in the future and all kinds of things. But this, this trail will remain if we build it right. Now, there is one um, piece of information I think is missing from this that the uh, developer will be building a bridge across Miller Creek and along that path is a bike connection um, route that goes all the way across to the county offices. So this walking path, uh, if it's a multi-use path, will also connect with that. So I, I think that's that's pretty exciting. I, I, I see there should be no way that we pass on the opportunity of uh, getting this trail started. Now, my experience in trail building uh, has been, you know, I started as a scout. I worked for uh, Massachusetts Audubon Society, the Appalachian Mountain Club, building trails uh, in addition to other things. And um, I have even volunteered here in the district to build trails with Tom Horn and, and some other local folks. Um, I guess they would be the kind of trails that uh, have been derisively uh, referred to as scratching out. And um, all I would say is um, let's get this trail uh, laid down and let's look for monies to improve it. Um, I've never driven an excavator it's kind of a foreign concept to me to build trails that way but i understand for the national park service and and for some county trails that's the way they do things but i don't really see that as necessary to get started here because once we have this trail up and running people will begin to use it and who's going to use it it's going to be uh people who want to access um the uh, center over there, uh, kids uh, going back and forth uh, through that area, um, and people who want to explore the Miller Creek watershed. You, it was described as not being a destination point. Well, maybe it's not, but I still think it would be the coolest thing ever. We almost have this access now where we can walk up the valley all the way to um, the beginning of Miller Creek. Um, and um, I think that would just be a really nice asset to have. So um, let's work with what we have, what we, can, we, what we can do with what we have. Now, I understand our staff doesn't, isn't really excited about this. Maybe we can get started with volunteers. Everything is possible if we stay focused optimistic and dream big that's all i have to say okay this will move on to uh, item number seven this is a designation of the commission chair and vice chair for 2022 uh, eric has uh, provided a staff report on this yeah, the staff report, John, is just really a copy and paste straight from the bylaws. This is something that we do um, every January uh, is what the bylaws call for, um, you know, just to be clear on it and certainly not to volunteer or, or assume for anybody. But it, 
I, I'm trying to reread this really quickly. I do not uh, uh, consecutively. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's any sort of limits to it or how many times that they could do this. I know, you know, uh, John Toon has graciously served as the chairperson for at least the last two years, um, if not more. Um, and thank you, because I think you do a great job with it and keeping the meetings going and working with us to get the agenda finalized. So thank you, John. Um, but that's kind of what it is. It's just a matter of needing a chairperson. The vice chair um, really is there to fill in in the event the chair can't make a meeting and they become the, the uh, facilitator and chair of the meetings. Um, John, I don't know if you want to speak to you know any of the time draws or anything like that that it really puts on you. Uh, just so the other commissioners have an idea if they're interested or not. Um, it's 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 not much time, but of course I don't uh, probably commit as much time as I should. So I don't know if anyone has any interest in it. Um, I'll just you know go we'll just let me hear what you think. I think you do a great job, John. Do you have any interest in Do you have <laughs> any interest in continuing <laughs> continuing to do it? Well, I, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I'm not opposed to continuing. Of course, I certainly don't want to hog all the glory. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think uh, obviously, I think. Uh, Michael's got to put a little more time in before he's eligible. But, and probably, Ian, you, you may have been here long enough to be eligible. I think you have to be here a year on the commission before. Who's our, current, who's our current vice chair? Did you say uh, that? John Campo is. I am? Whether he knows it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, I um, think that was part of uh, the was time I here that into a – yeah, I think that was part of the talking him into a second term last January. Well, if you oh. do it again, I would go ahead and be the vice chair oh. for you if needed. Ian, you want to try your hand at vice? Or Ann, do you have any interest? <laughs> <laughs> no. If you guys need me, I would do it, but go ahead. I you I, know, I think that yeah. I'll do the I'll do the same John Campo move and say, John Toon, if you will be chair again for another year, I'll I will I would do vice chair. A second. You know, I'm not asking for any motions yet here. Oh. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I, I will say just to put everybody's mind a little bit at ease too. And I know that sometimes facilitating the meetings themselves can be a little cumbersome. Um, you know, as staff, we try to make it as easy as we can on the, you know, not only say for the board president, the extra roles that they play, but also for all of the, the chairs of the commissions too. And uh, try to bring John uh, as much uh, game ready stuff as we can uh, to give him time to say, yep, that looks all good. Or, Hey, think about this. So we, it, I, I try to make it as little extra work as possible on you, recognizing that, you know, chairing the meeting is something that uh, is a comfort level too, and sometimes can be interesting. Making friends everywhere I go. <laughs> Um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll sit here for another year and that's fine. So I guess, uh, before we would move any further, I would ask for, if there's any, not anything else from the commission, I would ask for public comment. You don't have any public comment on this topic, John. Okay. Then, uh, I guess it would be. Was this designating this, is this a motion? Uh, I was actually just kind of reading that. Um, yeah, I would do it as a, as, a, uh, as a motion in a second and then take a vote. So it sounds like uh, if you have your motion, you just need somebody to make it and somebody to second it. So uh, uh, looking for a motion to uh, approve that I will come in continue as commission chair and Ian Fine will serve as the vice chair. Make that motion. Thank and you, Ann. And a second? I'll, I'll second. Of course you would, John. Thank you. <laughs> uh, all in favor? All right. Anybody opposed? 
And that uh, motion passes. Then we can uh, move right into item number eight. Uh, this is the Recreation and Park Maintenance Activity Report. Mr. Fretwell. Thank you, John. <clears throat> um, so I, I don't want to take too much too much time tonight, but um, just to give a, a brief overview of what's going on the last couple months since we last met. Um, the holiday, December and the holidays brought um, some of our, our regular events. We did, uh, um, instead of our, our normal winter fest event in the rec department, that's an indoor kind of open house arts and crafts and uh, games for the kids. We did a, a, an outdoor concert. Um, I'm not sure how many of you guys were able to make it to that, but we did a called the Jingle Bell Jazz and um, uh, ended up, uh, it was a, a new thing we had never really done before doing sort of an outdoor um, winter time concert by the community center. Uh, we still had Santa, uh, photos with Santa and some of the other things where we had um, hot chocolate and treats and, and um, live jazz music, uh, Christmas carols and, and whatnot. And it was a really lovely event and we had an amazing turnout um, in spite of it being freezing cold. Uh, we had all the, the heaters going and the fire pits and everything we could do, but uh, the staff did a really good job getting the place looking festive and, and lit up and it was a really nice time. And, and so, um, we, we may consider doing something uh, along those lines again in the future, um, even if, if we don't have the, the, the impetus because of COVID and trying to stay outdoors. But anyway, so that was really fun to, to pull off kind of a new wintertime event. Um, we ran our, our normal winter break camp uh, for the kids out of school the last two weeks of December, which went really well. And um, right now the, the rec staff is uh, finalizing a lot of our plans for the spring and summer. We're working on our Spring summer edition of the Marinwood Review, our, our catalog of all of our programs, events, and classes going on um, these next two seasons. And we're really excited to be getting back to a much more normal offering of programs and activities. And, um, and so we'll be, uh, that's almost done. We'll have that up on the website really soon. And we'll have that coming out in print, mailed to um, all, the, all the houses of all the residents and surrounding areas um, as well. So. Uh, we've got a lot of great classes uh, and activities and events this spring. And then um, we'll have our, our summer camp program kind of back to um, full speed this summer and the, the pool schedule and, and everything going on. So we've made some tweaks and some changes and, uh, and I think some improvements to, to what we normally offer. And we're really excited to release all of that. So uh, that I'll have more details at our next meeting, um, but we're, we're working hard in getting all of that finalized. And, and we're really excited for, for what we have coming up. On the, um, oh, and along with that, uh, Robin and John Paul have been doing a, a lot of interviewing and, and getting the staff figured out for um, the pool season and, as well as the summer camps. And um, we've got a lot of great people returning and uh, we're hiring some, uh, a lot of great new people as well. So that, that's exciting. Um, on the big news on the parks maintenance side of things um, is our big Creek Bank restoration effort we did uh, this last month and a little bit into January. Um, the, the big drought we've had this last couple of years, coupled with um, a lot of the heavy rain that we received this year, has really accelerated a lot of the erosion we've seen along um, certain areas of the creek. And we've um, seen, we've lost a few areas of the, of the park uh, in some slides in the last um, five to 10 years. And some areas have been continuing to erode. So we've just been trying to figure out what we can do to, to shore that up and um, how to protect our, our property, how to protect the banks and, and, and also how to um, do that in a way that, that is um, uh, correct practices with dealing with the creek. So we consulted with some some agencies around that deal with that and, and we got a lot of guidance and uh, staff went out um, many, many days uh, in December and January to um, do a lot of uh, plantings in the creek uh, along the banks, uh, mostly willow shoots and stakes that um, we've been planting in areas that have um, been eroding um, you know, quickly in, in areas where we've lost some land. So we probably planted um, close to 150 different um, willow stakes that you know, will hopefully grow into potential trees in the area and help stabilize the bank along with some other um, uh, plantings and, and shrubbery that, that will help put to protect from um, erosion. Uh, so we'll see what happens. It's going to take a while for us to know how many of these take under, under good conditions. We expect a 70 to 80 percent um, success rate for these these trees. Um, so we'll see what happens, but um, uh, and we'll, we'll 
continue to, to work on those efforts throughout the year. But December is um, the month when willow trees work on their root systems. Uh, and so it's a great, uh, it's, that's sort of the time to, to do new plantings and cut shoots off willow trees uh, and plant them uh, and space them apart. And um, it's, it's actually a pretty straightforward process. Um, so we, we did as much as we could on the days that weren't pouring rain and on some days that were pouring rain and we, we get we got a lot done and uh, so now we're just gonna cross our fingers and hope a lot of this uh, works and, and we'll continue so um, I'm really proud of, of our staff uh, that were out there um, rain or shine and some freezing cold getting soaking wet covered in mud um, trying to do whatever we can everything we can to pr preserve the uh, the creek bank in our along our property so um, that took a lot, a lot of time and we're playing a lot of catch up right now uh, with some other areas but uh, we're um, getting the pool ready for the pool season right now, checking all the equipment, getting a lot of things cleaned up, doing some deck and uh, pool shell repair, um, doing a lot of landscaping in the parks and um, preparing for our, our spring and summer season. So staff are super busy out there um, with, with that. Um, I'll leave you guys with that. Please let me know if you have any specific questions about anything on the parks or rec side. Was any of the erosion um, threatening any of the infrastructure? So um, I don't know if you guys remember, uh, uh, a, about a year ago, we did have a small um, mudslide uh, event happen right outside the tot pool area in the pool complex. And we did lose a, a chunk of deck and part of our fence went down and we did have to make a repair there. So that's one area we did focus on, John, um, of uh, doing a lot in. It seems that that area has, has stayed stable. We haven't um, seen any further erosion um, this, this season so far. That was the first area we, we tackled. Um, we, had a, we had a slide further down in the, we call it the far field, but the, uh, the, the flat grass field across from the tennis courts um, along the creek side of that. We had a big uh, slide there back in, I think that was 2017. Um, and that's what prompted us to build the fence that's now on the borders of the park there. And we did lose a big chunk of uh, turf um, in that event. And um, that area has also uh, remained relatively stable since. And, and that's not the area that we've, we've done some work on. Um, so as far as uh, those areas had pre previously done some damage and threatened some areas, um, and so those are areas that we're definitely focusing on as well as, as others. The, uh, the third one that was, that has been pretty problematic um, is along the main park, um, north uh, on the north side of the, of the main park closest to the community center, um, just before you get to the, the drainage culvert separating the two grass fields, um, there is an area there on just on the other side of the split rail fence where um, we lost kind of a chunk uh, or about a year ago and um, the, that area has been getting carved out a little bit so we did a lot of work in that area um, as well this this winter um, and that there may be more action required in all these we'll continue to monitor them and um, we do have a good resource list of people to come and help us uh, keep an eye on things and, get, and make recommendations. So sort of the start of the process, but um, we, we were taking advantage of um, December being kind of the magic month for doing uh, the native planting, uh, you know, uh, area, their um, approach that's, that's pretty much free and, and we can do, and then we'll kind of keep addressing things as we, as we need to do that uh, moving forward. Can I follow Luke up really quick? And I know he gave a lot of credit to everybody, but I, I got to give them even more. And this goes to Luke as well, um, because I, these guys were literally in the creek in chest waders on. If you remember when that, you know, those really cold days were coming through and they were down there uh, dealing with the elements, uh, battling with, uh, you know, some skin irritations due to the ivy and the poison oak and everything else out there. And it was just uh I, 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 if I had a hat on right now, I would, I couldn't take it off fast enough because it was just amazing the, the work and the effort and the dedication they put into that. So thank you, Luke, very, very, very much. Oh, thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, thank you, Luke. Anything from commissioners? Have you heard any reports of steelhead with this uh, winter rain? I haven't heard anything. Uh, we didn't. We didn't see anything when we were spending time out there. Um, but that doesn't mean that there haven't been sightings. But um, I haven't heard anything official. Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to make the 
jingle bell jazz thing but that sounds really lovely and um if if it was such a success i would i would definitely give a thumbs up to trying to make it a marinwood annual tradition yeah that, that one's um uh, unfortunately very weather affected uh we were very lucky that it didn't rain on us that would have put a big damper on everything but um we'll definitely you know that it, we'll, we'll do our best <laughs> Yeah, that nice was night to step outside and, and you could hear the band from my house. So that it was great. Yeah, I, I went there briefly towards the end and yeah, it was uh, really well done. Like the lights were beautiful, um, lots of families. So uh, kudos. Thank you. Uh, nothing else from the commission on the... Uh, Recreation and Park Maintenance Activity Report, I'd ask any uh, public comment. One second. Steven. Okay. I guess, uh, Moving on to item number nine, uh, any items of interest from commissioners for uh, future agenda items? Uh, hearing none, any uh, public comment on this item? And future agenda, yeah, one, one second. Hey, okay, um, it's about all we have for tonight. Uh, I would just like to thank uh, John Campo and Ian Fine for the work they did on uh, these different items that we discussed tonight. We really appreciate the effort you put into this projects. Um, if there's nothing else from commissioners or Mr. Case or staff, uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. No, thank you. That was a that was a good meeting. So I appreciate everybody's time and hanging in there for a two hour show. Chris has some. Chris has some. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to extend it. I know this has been a long meeting and a big agenda. I, I previously threw out, and I probably should have mentioned this earlier, um, a question for you guys to take a look at about the fireman's picnic area. Um, I don't want to discuss it tonight, but maybe, I think it fell like we had two meetings in a row and because of the calendar or something, you guys didn't have a meeting. Right. Um, and I know Luke, you gave a, 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 it said that you guys discussed it briefly. I'm just like, I'm trying to think of ways that we could, without spending much money, that we could improve what we're offering our community so that people can enjoy things more. Um, and, you know, I walk, you know, my giant walk from here to school or my bike ride, I go past the fireman's picnic area. And I just wonder if there's something that we could look at there to, to you know, I just, how, how can we improve some of these areas that, um, have you know great offer great resources and and kind of what steven was saying like we don't have to live in the past what are ways that we could upgrade without like realistically affecting the budget um and i wonder too safety wise we've got two barbecues in that area in a very wooded area and, and i saw evidence of a campfire in one of them with some partially burned logs and just made me think you know let's start thinking about this some open space ideas things of that nature yeah, that'd be, could we maybe just have like a future agenda item of even just a brainstorming session where we throw out ideas and I don't know, unless there's, unless like Luke and Eric, you guys think you're able to like put something more concrete together at the very least, it seems like we could just at least spend 15 minutes bouncing ideas around and seeing if that sparks anything. Yeah, I, I, I certainly think that could. And Luke and I, and Chris, I apologize. We just had uh, for you know this particular meeting, we had a, a lot going on this agenda too, and I kind of no, lost. There's that. no apologies that, that necessary. You guys are all doing great work, and I appreciate it. Um, but for the fireman's picnic area, I think I could probably, and I don't want to volunteer, Luke, but we could probably put together some sort of a you know just a brief little presentation of some slides on that that would help lead into the discussion since we're not really getting together in person right now. Um, otherwise, I would say in the summertime, especially, that would make a nice place to have an in-person meeting out there. Uh, and who knows, maybe things will change. But give us a little bit of time. We'll see what we can get going. And, and I uh, logged down the idea of maybe a brainstorming for open space ideas. Very good. Anything else? 
Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice Thanks. evening.